classic. I've been in this chair for a half hour waiting for you. Miramax Dimension uh, Films uh, had uh, an idea to do a trilogy, a sci-fi trilogy, and Philip K. Dick's short story, Imposter, was to be the core component. And action! When they started seeing dailies at Dimension, they realized this deserved more than just to be part of a, a trilogy. It deserved to be a freestanding movie, and plans were immediately made while the other filming was still in progress to make this a, 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 a theatrical film. To me, Imposter was the quintessential Dick story and uh, the quintessential, you know, um, Kafka story. So tonight's a big night, huh? Huge. This one guy wakes up one morning, goes to work, and all of a sudden he's being accused of being something else. And it's sort of the most terrifying conflict of all. Of you aren't who you are. What is reality? What is accusation? This particular film hat certainly has its um, huge sets. The art direction is really fabulous. The production design is fabulous. You just you feel it's much more about the people involved. One of the things that we really wanted to stress when we got into this material was doing something that was very plausible and basically doing a drama that just happened to be sci-fi. We didn't want to showboat and point up, uh, you know look at the design, look at what we can do, and that sort of stuff, but yet it all had to support the story in a very believable manner. So we were trying to come up with environments and with real technologies, speaking with futurists, speaking with all sorts of scientists that are currently working on things that are coming into play, looking at architecture uh, that is currently under construction or is about to go into construction all around the world, and trying to come up with believable extensions of where we are today projecting at 75 years into the future. You want to get a sense that this is real. We didn't want to do something that seemed so far-fetched that it, you know, it put you, took you immediately into some artificial place. We wanted to say, hey, you, you can relate to this future world because it's not that different than the world you know right now. It's not too far into the future that we don't use a couple of uh, songs from from today, you know, he goes into the past and no, plays no, a song that at that time will be a hundred years old. Hooker, John Lee. But uh, he likes oldies. <laughs> We're still connected in some ways, but then there are quite a few futuristic details. For example, uh, the planet has been in such jeopardy from other species and other life forms from other galaxies that they've built a dome. The domes are like giant soap bubbles and domes cover the entire earth, thousands and thousands of domes. You know when two soap bubbles touch, they kind of join. Well, the portal is where these, all these soap bubbles join. Everyone, there's a portal. And that's to prevent Centauri, if they get on the planet, from getting to certain areas. We used the Sepulveda Dam Basin and enhanced that, made it a portal between two different dome sections of the earth. At the dam, we're going to actually extend the dam and we're going to build this futuristic portal effect. we will see bugs and people going through. The overall look is tailored, spare, it's wartime in the movie, so that drives a lot of the architecture. It's like a modern day WPA, Works Progress Administration. Uh, it's rarefied wood, as if the trees are not as prevalent as they currently are, which the way we're going right now could be the, the real case. And um, a lot of cast in place form uh, poured concrete. There's a lot of nice tailored finished materials, you know, stainless steels and frosted glasses and things. So it, it really looks nice yet it is very spare, it is exactly what is needed to do whatever you know that particular task is. Also, we wanted to add into the story a bit of unsettled uh, vertigo, uh, if you will, for Gary Sinise's character, because he is kind of off balance in this whole movie, trying to figure out what's going on, where he's headed, who he is, who he's not. We wanted things to have a sense of danger there is a level of the macabre that makes its way into it. You'll see an interrogation table, the scan room table, all of the uh, beds. They all take their shapes from classic coffins or sarcophagus or you know pine box, all that. So you don't quite know if people are getting healed in these things or if you know something else is happening. In Imposter, the two things we're basically doing is we're creating the environment, the futuristic environment in which the action takes place. And then we're creating technology that supports the action. Um, for instance, there are vid phones, so of course those need to be created as visual effects.
um, there's this high-tech scanner, body scanner, which is the, really the MacGuffin of the whole movie. That's what Spence is going for, this body scanner. Oh, it's time to go. Right now. Right now. So that's got to support, you know, his search, and it's got to, it's got to reach the audience's expectations of this really super technology. And then there's the RMR sequence where they're scanning the buildings. Ready yourself, gentlemen. One floor at a time, Sergeant. They can tell you what's inside that building. It's like a super duper uh, x-ray. And that again supports the ESA and the super high technology. I, I think um, that those two sequences are going to give people a feel that this is truly the year 2075. And they truly are seeing, you know, these super advanced future technologies. Read that, please. She knows. One of the reasons to do so much video in the scenes while we're doing them is so that you can have maximum flexibility for the control of where we actually want things to start and how it reflects onto an actor's face really puts you more into the environment. I don't want the movie to have a feeling that, oh, all of these things were added in post. I want you to really believe that everything is happening. So I never want the newscasters to leave the screen, and so they just kind of slide across, and you kind of see part of them looking at you while another story is playing, and then they slide back on and continue talking. So you get the sense that you're being watched in a different Orwellian way than 1984. The um, video screens in the chapel came about with Gary and Mai's discussion of having a space that was like very zen kind of chapel. If you could take George Winston music and put it into a chapel, what would it look like? You have kind of that repetitive surf hitting the beach and clouds moving toward the camera and shadows moving across the fields. It's comforting and yet it's really kind of bizarre at the same time. Why would that be in that space? And the raked floor most uh, auditoriums have a raked floor so you can see the, the person at the dais in front. And yet it also helps with the skewed angle so that Hathaway can come in and actually tower over Maya as she's sitting there. And you know, it's just playing with the spaces enough that it propels the story, that there are no arbitrary choices, that everything is making the story stronger instead of just, oh, well, this will work. And um, you end up with a stronger movie on first, second, and third viewings. And these days, you know, with you know, movies living so much longer, you know, everyone has time to stop and look and see that scene over again on their DVD. And you want it to make sense and everything support the story in a way that's just not random. Cap, bug, start the bug. The bug station was a full-size set that Nelson had built. Um, we had a full-size bug that was actually brought into the station. Um, there are shots right now that are planned which show the exterior of the bug station. And those will be executed with 3D map paintings. Those are being done by Industrial Light and Magic. Um, those shots, again, will match the look and the feel that Nelson created within the bug station. But those will be totally generated inside of a computer. There will be no existing models or architecture. Um, and the only thing they're really matching, per se, is the look of the bug. One of the largest sets that we use is about 18,000 square feet, and that's the bug station, uh, the mode of transportation that Philip K. Dick described in his book, referred to as a bug. It flies, it hovers, it's kind of the mass transit of the future. And you derive the power for the bug from the electromagnetic domes. And so we needed a scene where the bug is actually landing in a station, and the stations are on the tops of buildings, and you have like 150 people on the, on the station landing. The bug gets to its place, and that set was so technical because the bug had to come in, it had to drop, it had steam, it had all the playback inside the bug as it's moving as well as playback on the station. Landings had to meet the doors as they open and all the people and that sort of thing. That, um, in a way, that's kind of my favorite so far because it just had so many elements and it was really, really tough and to get past it. It's a big relief. <laughs> when you're creating a visual effect shot from nothing, when it's all created, it's the hardest thing to do and to make it look real because um, there's so much subtlety and reality that to have to put that all into the plate gets to be incredibly difficult. When you have a basis of reality, when you have the characters there, when you have the dam, you're basically extending that, so you're doubling the dam. But you have the dam as reference, so when your extension looks as real as the dam, you know you're there, you know. Um, when you're building, let's say, the hospital, totally in CG, there's no real life reference, so you're looking at it, and it's always hard to know when you got it, you know. And of course, the artists are the most critical people. So when they're doing this stuff, they want it to look, you know, realer than real. 
for me, science fiction is seldom so grounded in science fact and what we can relate to in today's terms that it, it resonates in the future. And so you say, hey, that's cool, that could happen. Wrap around the line. You know, the most challenging aspect of this film for me is lending credibility to a very, very uh, foreign context, you know, is taking a science fiction piece, taking a futuristic piece, and taking a piece that is basically fantastical and giving it some level of um, a credibility. I've seen certain films that to me simply become comic books or cartoons, and you're led, led along by visual virtuosity, not by emotional, you know, credibility. And I think this film, for me, the challenge has been to sort of find a way to keep it real. And whether it's 1942 or 2042 is keep it feeling like it's emotionally correct. It's keeping it grounded. So it's a, it's a wonderful cast, and, and uh, it's been a, an enjoyable experience. I mean, it's sort of like being a kid again, you know, doing these kind of things. The planet has been in such jeopardy from other species and other life forms from other galaxies that they've built a dome around the entire planet. Um, and occasionally, these other species penetrate that dome and get, get in. And that's what's, uh, what the fear in this movie is that uh, Centauri spies have come in and abducted certain human beings and turned them into human bombs. Vince D'Onofrio's character is uh, interrogating me because he thinks that I am a... Uh, human bomb and he truly believes that I've been uh, I'm a spy and I've been uh, and I'm an assassin and I've been programmed to detonate uh, at a, an opportune time when I'm happen to be right next to the the Chancellor who runs the planet aside from the action one of the other things that I liked about uh, the story was that in the center of it, uh, there's this kind of emo sweet emotional love story between my character, Spencer Olam, and his wife, uh, played by Madeline Stowe, and the, and the two of us have a very kind of tender relationship uh, that gets placed in jeopardy because of what happens to me, my abduction. I think there's a lot of themes about, you know, you know, some of the, the themes of what war can do to, to human beings and uh, what, what happens to them when they have very personal connections to it. She plays a, a, a surgeon, doctor in, in, in this, and they have a very sweet relationship and she's wonderful to work with and just uh, very there, you know, uh, at all times. Uh, for the other actors and I think we have a good you know I'm enjoying working with her I think we have a good good chemistry you know it seems to be a very collaborative cooperative working environment um, but Gary's very well prepared he knows what kind of shots he wants he knows where he wants to put the camera he's got it all drawn up it's the whole movie's storyboarded so he knows where he's going with the camera uh, and then it's our jobs, the DP and the actors and other people, to kind of fill that out and make that come to life and help that come to life in the best way possible. Well, I think the character uh, is somebody who's very much in doubt. And she's somebody whose life was, was always real certain, uh, within a very uncertain framework, because obviously they're <laughs> it's really extreme what's going on in the world. And um, she finds out that that her husband is suspected of treason and may have committed murder and this doesn't seem like the man that she knows at all and uh, when a person when a character uh, feels like they know how they're going to react to a certain situation and they don't respond that way at all those are always really interesting things to to play and I think that um, the audience has to always not know where she's standing you know ambiguities fascinating <laughs> 
it, it is very much on these two characters. I mean, you have to be with them. You have to want them to make it. You have to have to want them to um, to be in love with one another. You know. I mean, otherwise, the rest of the world is meaningless anyway. It's how all of our lives operate every day. So um, I, I think that those are th some things that have traditionally been lacking in science fiction, and, and it was really one of the reasons I was very drawn to this. Gary has a, has a real uh, interesting methodology. I think that he is very cogent and very clear about his approach. Uh, he really looks over the material very carefully, and he's really forced into playing a, a character in a really in an extreme situation, and does it with complete gusto. <laughs> You have to have a director that you can trust. I mean, if this were in another director's hands, I don't know what I would think about it. I don't know that I would have committed to it, you know? Um, and it's in his hands, and you know that he's going to maximize the potential. Everything has the potential to be wonderful or not, you know? And um, the script very much has that. And I think that he's, he's going to do a pretty smashing job with it. When they sort of brought this over to me, I. I was uncertain at first because I don't normally relate to anything that's futuristic or, or this particular. But I was really intrigued about the idea of, of, of working with him because he shoots people so well. So, you know, I mean, you sort of really feel them breathe and, and, and you don't often get that. Definitely. They have a very, um, very intimate, a very physical relationship as well. And, I don't know, you don't see that very often in, in, in futuristic things, you know? Sort of um, touching flesh, just, it doesn't seem to be conducive to it somehow. And I, I think that's kind of an interesting take on it. When you feel the director and the camera crew and, and everybody just right there with the actors in the middle of the scene. It's like you're drawing from the same breath. And those are very rare instances when they happen. But when they do, you don't ever forget them. It's a, it's a sci-fi, yet it's, it's emotional. It, it's an emotional story as well. It has a lot of humanity in it uh, for a kind of science fiction type of thing. That, that attracted me to it. Too. He's learned that there is a man who Gary Sinise plays Spencer Olam, who is a walking, talking tool for assassination. He's a bomb. Um, and my job is to get him and uh, interrogate him for the company to see to, as, a, as a sort of exhibit, and then extract the bomb from him. No, it's 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 very kind of big brotherish. This world, yeah, it's controlled. There, everybody's watching. And everybody's very uh, suspicious. It just it's like a, a fast-paced ride from the beginning all the way to the end. I play Kale, who um, has done a lot of special force missions. Um, who's done a lot of combat missions, um, who kind of lives on the outskirts of society. Um, it is the future, and um, there's a different class of system. There's a different class, uh, class system. And um, I live kind of on the outskirts of, of the norm. There's all the elements of an action film in it. There's all the intensity, but action films can sometimes tend to lack substance, and this has stuff, substance. Um, it has all the substance that I've gotten from dramas and, and even comedies, and, it's, and it's, it, the substance is there, and the audience will be able to grasp onto the story as well as the fun that's going on. As an actor, you know, you're constantly learning. Um, I'm a young guy in the business. I've um, only been in the business a few years, um, and so there's so much to learn. And uh, with all these great people surrounding me, it can only elevate the craft. So um, I'm very appreciative. You, you never know uh, who could be an imposter, you know? <laughs> Imposter's a film about, you know, what is real and, and belief and having faith, looking in someone's eyes and knowing that they're saying this, what they're saying is true. And in the film, you see Spence Olin being abandoned by everybody around him. Even his best friend, played by Tony Shalhoub, and I think that 
You know, what's so important is the third act. You have to see if the wife will be traigas, one person who believes it. Can look into his eyes and see his soul and believe that he is who he is. It goes back to the very basic of sort of, of the Kafkaesque experience, the idea that um, who are we, and what, you know, and uh, what is reality. And to me, the imposter was the quintessential dick story and uh, the quintessential, you know, um, Kafka story. Okay, Sven Solom is pretty much a guy who's never been sort of subjected to this kind of physical um, and emotional duress. And the film tracks as well his struggle not only emotionally but also physically and how he has to endure and escape and be chased and sort of finally uh, either, um, you know, become victorious or not in terms of defending his identity. You know, the most challenging aspect of this film for me is lending credibility to a very, very uh, foreign context, you know, is taking a science fiction piece, taking a futuristic piece, and taking a piece that is basically fantastical and giving it some level of, um, of credibility, not becoming a cartoon. We got very, very lucky with this picture, with getting Gary Sinise to play uh, Spence Long, because Gary really does typify for me the sort of the everyman. He doesn't, he doesn't feel like he's a superhero, he doesn't feel like he's the kind of guy that would have to sort of endure and escape some horrible situation. He feels like the every guy. I mean, Gary Sinise has that, has that genius and has that quality. Um, and also, by the way, he's a fantastic actor. The core relationship of the film is not Hathaway and Spence, I even Sinofrio and Gary Sinise. It's really Gary Sinise and Madeline Stowe, Spence and Maya. It's a very important relationship in the picture. It's the it's the couple, the married couple, and and I spent a lot of time shooting the opening scene and also the closing scenes between them because I feel that if you don't buy into that relationship, the film doesn't work. Prominent scientist, the caliber of uh, Oppenheimer, is working uh, for the government on the development of a, uh, a uh, super weapon. And the super weapon is necessary because Earth has been, has been attacked by an alien uh, race from Alpha Centauri. And uh, the aliens uh, are trying to uh, penetrate our, uh, our, our world and our society. And this scientist goes to bed one one morning, one evening, and, and uh, wakes up the next day and goes to work and is told when he arrives at work, you're not who you say you are, you're an alien. They are in love. They, they are both doing important work. One is a, a scientist, one is a doctor, but they're frustrated by what they're not doing, which is having time to enjoy family and having time to, to enjoy freedom and, and to see the stars and the sky in an uninterrupted um, way instead of seeing them through domes. Gary Sinise brings this quality of, of uh, reality, a quality of, of uh, this is actually happening. This could happen to me. What would, what would happen if someone told me tomorrow, I'm not who I say I am? Prove it. How do you go about proving it? What do you do to save yourself? Gary Sinise brings that to the, uh, to the, to the performance in, in, in a way that um, I don't think very many actors can bring. Madeline Stowe, again, they, you feel a real sense of relationship between these people, real love, real caring, and you want them to be okay. You want the world to be okay. And she, uh, she and Gary have a, a fabulous chemistry. And, uh, you, you know, you really enjoy watching them for every minute they're on the screen together. You want to get a sense that this is real. We didn't want to do something that seemed so far-fetched that it, you know, it put you, took you immediately into some artificial place. We wanted to say, hey, you, you can, relate to this future world because it's not that different than the world you know right now. All of our additions, all of our scientific uh, gadgets have all been researched with the help of uh, uh, a lot of scientists, but 
but uh, predominantly we worked with uh, our friends at uh, uh, Walt Disney Imagineering. <clears throat> and they, uh, Bran Farron, who's the uh, president of World Walt Disney Imagineering uh, Research and Development, and his whole think tank of scientists and future thinkers, the guys who are responsible for a lot of the uh, future technology at uh, uh, Disney. And one of the things that we really wanted to stress when we got into this material was doing something that was very plausible and basically doing a drama that just happened to be sci-fi. We didn't want to showboat and point up, uh, you know, look at the design, look at what we can do and that sort of stuff. But yet it all had to support the story in a very believable manner. Uh, speaking with futurists, speaking with uh, uh, all sorts of scientists that are currently working on things that are coming into play, looking at architecture uh, that is currently under construction or is about to go into construction all around the world, and trying to come up with believable extensions of where we are today, projecting it 75 years into the future. It's, it's a dream, having worked with both our lead actor and the director before. Um, one, I kind of know their expectations, and I know their physical abilities, uh, such as um, Gary has a very strenuous show. Uh, a lot of things are required of him in Imposter. And by knowing his size and how far he can reach and how far he can jump and doing all those things, I've been able to design the sets so that they're all within his physical range and you end up using a, a, a stunt double much less. You end up using you know, a, a photo double much, much less than you normally would because he can actually be in the sets and doing you know, the activities that we're asking him to do. Uh, the mode of transportation that Philip K. Dick described in his book was referred to as a bug. It flies, it hovers, it's kind of the mass transit of the future. And how we have parlayed that into the movie is that the uh, city areas are all covered with electromagnetic domes that you derive the power grid for the city. It also serves as the, um, uh, the power for the bug and how the bug trans, you know, transports back and forth. And so we needed a scene where the bug is actually landing in a station and the stations are on the tops of buildings and stuff and you'll see that in the movie. And we have the bug actually landing in and you have like 150 people on the, on the station landing. The bug gets to its place and it does look like an insect of sorts. Um, though if you look at the high speed bullet trains that are in, in Japan now and the fronts of those and how those have an insect like look to them, it's not so far fetched that this has this sort of look. I always find it uh, very challenging to scare myself just a little bit when I design a movie and to do things that I haven't done before. And in this particular movie, we've used a lot of materials and a lot of structural things that really pushed my draftsmen, it pushed my carpenters, a lot of compound curves and compound angles. Uh, of course, they'll say I do that all the time, but uh, uh, I've really pushed everybody uh, to go further and uh, my whole team has really responded and done great in uh, using some elements structurally and materials-wise that uh, we've never used before on a movie. Um, the bug station was a full-size set that Nelson had built. Um, we had a full-size bug that was actually brought into the station. Um, there are shots right now that are planned which show the exterior of the bug station, and those will be executed with 3D matte painting. Those are being done by Industrial Line of Magic. Um, those shots, again, will match the look and the feel that Nelson created within the bug station. But those will be totally generated inside of a computer. There'll be no existing models or architecture. Um, and the only thing they're really matching, per se, is the look of the bug, because we see it. The look of the exterior city, besides some of the locations that we shot, is going to be totally generated by map paintings. In Imposter, the two things we're basically doing is we're creating the environment, the futuristic environment in which the action takes place. And then we're creating technology that supports the action. Um, for instance, there are vid phones. So of course those need to be created as visual effects. Um, there's this high-tech scanner, body scanner, which again is visual effects. Um, there's a high-tech, it's kind of a, a chase movie. They're chasing this uh, character Spence. So there are high-tech um, spy devices, whatever you want to call them. There's a big RMR which scans buildings and can tell you what's inside that building. It's like a super, super duper uh, x-ray. And that again will be created with visual effects. 
I say the two major sequences besides the map paintings are the body scan, which is the, really the MacGuffin of the whole movie. That's what Spence is going for, this body scan. So that's got to support you know, his search, and it's got, to, it's got to reach the audience's expectations of this really super technology. And then there's the RMR sequence, where they're scanning the buildings. And that, again, supports the ESA and the super high technology. Uh, I think um, that those two sequences are going to give people a feel that this is truly the year 2075. Gary's very definitive. I mean, he knows when what he sees is working. And, um, and you know, it's great to work with a director like that. Take away the cut. Steve, is he out? Fingers, it's gonna blow. Ten, nine. Oh, Couldn't get my leg up. Hey, chocolate mocha? It's the same guy from last night. I don't know what you had last night. It's a mocha. Just a, 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 a iced mocha. Uh, iced mocha. I'm looking like here. We're coming back. Hey, Mark. Sit. And action. That's right. Strap in the robot. Watch your fingers. It's going to blow. Ten. Nine. Eight. Interesting wardrobe in this. I like it. I like the look anyway.
smoke for a second, Justin. I'm going to smoke for a second. I got it. Let me see if I can fan on in the smoke for a second. Right there. Right there. Like this. Let's sell that and move down to get that piece, or is it a separate piece? I.e. here, here, here. Let's see if we can do a cut. Maybe the camera's even down below, like this. The set is a lock off. Yeah. Look at that. Let's go dance. Let's go dance. <laughs> um, That the gun is pointing at my back. Right, right, right. So maybe. Car up on the road. It's a buck. There's people going by okay. up there. We just gotta stop driving. Okay. Clear. Uh, this way. Border patrol. That's right. Can they keep moving? Whatever you're gonna trade me for, whatever you can get, I'll triple it. It's too late. Food rations, house allocation, supply schedules, and bunkers. You name it, I can get you all of it. Come on, help me out here, please. And action! <sighs> whatever you're gonna trade me for, whatever you can get, I'll triple it. Too late. Food rations, house allocation, supply schedules to bunkers, I can get you all of it. Come on. So that's after the push, you're back here, right? And action. Set and set. Set. Ready and action. Ready. Ready. Right. All right, we're gonna change it.
Tus trailers, visita mi canal. They have to come out, do a, a, a bit of a, be somewhat cautious before they come out of the, that, that apron there, mm -hmm. and then get to these positions. Come on. This way. Come on. Are you sure? You understand now what's going on? Uh, stop, stop, stop. stop. Just stop. Okay. Come right there. Come right there. Take eight. This way. 